One of the most difficult things to explain in Jehovah's Witness theology is the significance of the claim that Jerusalem fell in 607 or 587. I'm not going to go into the doctrinal implications of that date being wrong. I'll link other videos that do a better job of that. But what I want to try and do is visually show why that date is wrong. It's a hard thing to wrap your head around. Jehovah's Witnesses are one of the only groups that assert that Jerusalem fell in 607 BCE. The universally accepted dating for Jerusalem's fall is 587 BCE. Other videos go into the doctrinal reasons for this, which I'll link below. What I wanted to focus on was some of the lines of evidence that disprove 607 and to try to visualize them in a way that makes it easier to understand. This is the timeline of Babylonian kings for the time period in question. We'll start our research where every good Jehovah's Witness should, Watchtower Online Library. You can get to the fall of Jerusalem in 587 using just Watchtower sources. Watchtower accepts the dating by scholars of the fall of Babylon as 539 BCE. We'll start there and work our way backwards through the kings list. Nabonidus ruled for 17 years. The next in line before him was Labashi Marduk, who ruled for nine months. Before him was Nereglasar, who ruled for four years. And before him, Evil Marduk, who ruled for two years. And earliest, Nebuchadnezzar, who ruled for 43 years. So we add all of those things together, and we get 606. Now we read 2 Kings that in the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, he destroyed Jerusalem. We subtract 19 from our 606, and we get 587 as the fall of Jerusalem. We're all done, and thank you for watching. Except that Watchtower complicates this issue with a couple of arguments. They question the accuracy of the records in a few ways. They need to get an extra 20 years into the 70-year time period in order to make Jerusalem fall in 607. The first line of argumentation is that Nabonidus ruled not for 17 years, but 37 years. There's a reason why they chose Nabonidus. There's a document called the Adagapi Steel. This is a monument erected for the mother of Nabonidus on her death. She died in the ninth year of Nabonidus, and it lists her life, which was very long. She lived for 104 years. On this document, it lists the various kings that she served as a priestess for, and multiple versions of this monument have been found. The reason they add 20 years to Nabonidus is that if they added 20 years anywhere else in the timeline, besides the short window after Adagapi's death and before the fall of Babylon, she would have lived for more than 120 years. While this is possible, there are confirmed people that have lived to 116, it's a real stretch of credibility for someone without modern medicine to have lived to 120-something years of age. And also, surely they would have noted her amazingly long life on the monument commemorating her. So to avoid this, they put 20 years in the small gap after her death, and this grows Nabonidus' reign to 37 years. There's many problems with this, one of which is that there are Syrian kings that are listed at the beginning of Adagapi's life, which would interfere with the timeline further back. But there's an even bigger problem with the solution for Watchtower. There's a document called the Nabonidus Chronicle. This is a clay document that is referred to multiple times in various Watchtower publications where the Watchtower uses the Nabonidus Chronicle as proof of the accuracy of the Bible, that the Bible and archaeology are in agreement. Watchtower wants it both ways with this document, that on one hand it confirms the accuracy of the Bible, but on the other hand they want to ignore a record that destroys their timeline. Cyrus is recorded to have defeated the king of Media in the sixth year of Nabonidus. In the Watchtower timeline, that would mean that Cyrus would defeat the king of Media before Cyrus ever came to power, which is obviously impossible. The next idea that Watchtower has for the timeline is that there are gaps between the kings. 
There might have been years where there was no king that ruled, or that kings weren't recorded, and this accounts for the 20 years of missing time. Is this feasible? During this time period, there was a banking family that operated called the Agibi family. They were the Rothschilds of their day, loaning amounts of money ranging from small sums to enormous sums. They recorded their loans with the start of the loan, which was the year of the current king's reign, the amount, and then when the loan was paid off, the date would again be recorded with the year of the current king. Over 2,500 documents were found in one storehouse recording loans over the years of operation for this banking family. And years later, another trove of documents of over 3,000 records was found. What this does is confirm multiple things. There are loans made in the last year for every king. That means the lengths of the reigns are confirmed. None of the kings reigned for a longer period of time than is recorded in the other sources. Additionally, there are also loans made in every king's reign that are completed in the next king's reign. This stitches together each king, leaving no gaps. There are many overlapping loans, which enable this time period to be reconstructed with a great degree of certainty. This time period is so well documented that the transition from evil Marduk, the end of his reign, to the beginning of Nereglasar's reign, is a four-day time period between August 7th and August 11th, 560 BCE. There's a four-day gap between two kings, not months or years. In addition with these records, there was three men that ran the banking family. It's recorded when and under what king they started running the business, and then the end of that person's position as head of the banking family and the beginning of the next one. When added together, the length of time here perfectly matches the other records. What this gives us is confirmation of the king's list, the order of the kings, the lengths they ruled, and the total length of time of this time period. There are no gaps of years of, or missing kings. There is no record of an unknown king found somewhere in these documents. There are additional lines of evidence that could be added to this to further strengthen the timeline, but I don't think I could explain them well and frankly, it's unnecessary. The evidence presented here is enough to have this be a solid, trusted timeline. All of these different sources confirm the other sources. What we've talked about so far is relative dating, the time of reign of each king, the space in between, the lengths of their reigns, but that doesn't give us absolute dating. Where that comes in is star position information that was recorded by the Babylonian priests. They recorded the position and phase of the moon, where and when it rose, the positions of planets and constellations, and how all of these things were relative to each other. What can be done with this information is when put into a computer program, the night sky can be simulated and we can rewind time to when this particular pattern appears from the point of view in Babylon. These patterns only repeat every few thousand years. So by putting these star positions in, we can tell within to a couple days of when each of these observations was made. There are also observations made from multiple different cities within the Babylonian time period. There are many, many star position records and they can be used to date this period to a high degree of accuracy. In fact, it's so accurate that the burned rubble of Jerusalem is used as a standard for studying how the Earth's magnetic field has changed over time. I won't go into detail on this. There's a link to the story below, but suffice it to say that scientists are so confident in the dating of this time period that they're willing to use it as a basis for further areas of study. As I mentioned, there are other lines of evidence that could be considered to further solidify this timeline, and this includes Egyptian records. All of them are in agreement that Jerusalem fell in 587. 
Now, does believing Jerusalem fell in 587 mean you have to stop trusting in the Bible or stop being a Christian or stop believing in God? No. There are biblical scholars that use the accepted timeline for this period as proof of biblical accuracy. In the Gentile Times Reconsidered, Carl Olaf Johnson considers 17 lines of evidence. I've only considered a few that he talks about in his book. All of them are in agreement, confirming that Jerusalem fell in 587. He also shows how this does not conflict with the Bible. I highly recommend reading his book, if not all the technical details, the summaries at the end of each chapter, and then you can confirm for yourself all of the sources that he cites. Uh, there's a link to his official website below. He also has rebuttals for the 2011 articles and further developments both in Watchtower publications and new archaeological evidence that has come out since he published his book. It might not surprise you, but the archaeological evidence that has been developed since then only strengthens the case for 587. The final thing I wanted to bring out is how this reflects on Watchtower and the intellectual dishonesty they are willing to engage in when it suits their aims. If you search Watchtower Online Library for Adagape or the Gibby family, you won't find one mention of either of these things because it destroys Watchtower's narrative of the timeline. Watchtower has no positive proof for 607 being the fall of Jerusalem. If they did, if there was any records that pointed to a missing king or inaccuracies in the dating that could account for 20 years, there's no doubt that they would have highlighted these. The two-part article in 2011 spent the vast majority of time trying to undermine the legitimacy of 587. The experts that Watchtower quotes are in fact misquoted to try and bolster their narrative. Again, probably unsurprising. If you read where these quotes are taken from in context, the researcher's statements don't support 607 at all. It's a clear case of quote mining and misquoting. The only positive proof that Watchtower presented in the 2011 articles was an alternative dating made using the star charts. This star position study was done by a Dr. Rolf Ferulli, who is a professor emeritus of Semitic languages at the University of Oslo. He confirms that he was the expert that was cited and also that he consulted with Watchtower heavily in the production of these articles. In the 2011 article, Watchtower doesn't cite the source for their star position study. They don't say where it was published, what university, the researcher's name, and it's obvious why they did that, because Dr. Ferulli was a witness at the time that he did his research. He has an obvious bias in this particular matter. He was also the only scholar of note to defend 607. It should be pointed out that this is not his field of study. Dr. Ferulli is not an archaeologist or an astronomer. And while it seems like he is very skilled within his field of study of translation, this is not what he is an expert in. Other researchers who are knowledgeable about star dating have widely panned his research and debunked his findings. This is not exactly pertinent to whether or not his information can be trusted, but since early 2020, Dr. Ferulli has been disfellowshipped for apostasy. You can read about his thoughts on the governing body, and he talks about his involvement in the 2011 articles. The title of his book is My Beloved Religion. All of that being said, I am not an expert. I do not have a background in any of these fields. This is merely my layman's research into other people's work. I encourage you to do your own research and confirm these things for yourself. And I hope that was helpful in explaining this, and thank you for watching.